Hi everybody. Today I'm going to tell you about realism, the literary and cultural paradigm that dominated American literature after romanticism, which is the last artistic movement that we talked about. So I'll explain some of the cultural currents that led to the decline of romanticism and the rise of realism, and then explain the key tenets of realism as an artistic paradigm. So the dates I'm giving you for this <clears throat> period of uh, artistic thought are 1865 to the early 1900s. And whenever I talk about dates for certain artistic movements like romanticism or realism or naturalism or modernism or postmodernism, remember that these are um, these are talking about the times when a certain school of thought is dominant in American arts, culture, and literature. These movements never really go entirely away. Uh, to a huge extent, Romanticism has influenced American literature and culture and continues to do so. And the same is true with realism. Realism has an enormous influence on the way we tell stories, even today in 2020, and it didn't stop uh, in uh, the early 1900s. But as a way of kind of understanding the way movements shift into each other and ways of thinking shift into each other, uh, we say that the, uh, the dominance of realism as a paradigm or an artistic movement uh, declined in the early 1900s in the same way that the dominance of realism declined uh, in America in the 1860s. And maybe you remember why. Oh, before I get into that, uh, the image in my background right there is a painting by George Bellows entitled New York, and it was painted in 1911. And if you have a good look at that image, you can see a number of the um, concerns of realism reflected in it. Take just a moment to uh, just look around. Notice, first of all, it's in, the date is 1911, and already you've got large buildings looming on the skyline in the background here. The painting is very concerned with uh, the people that populate it. You see movement. You see a trolley in the background. You see horse-drawn carriages carrying people and goods around the city of New York. Right? So realism is a movement that's going to be concerned with ordinary everyday people and urban spaces in big ways. Now what's interesting to me is if you take this um, painting and you contrast it with one that I showed you when we were talking about American Romanticism, Cropsey's Autumn on the Hudson River, we're talking about the same region, the Hudson River in New York, right? But this one's painted in 1860, so it reflects the kind of artistic perspective of Romanticism. Notice the big differences here in what the artist chooses to capture and how he captures it. In this painting, you have nature in well, not just the foreground, the foreground and the background, right? You have this kind of soft glow. Nature is sublime and beautiful um, and, um, and very prominent in this particular painting. So what do you remember about American Romanticism? We said that the dates for this were from 1820, which is the beginning of an American literary tradition um, with Washington Irving's sketchbook, to 1861. Why that date? Why 1861? Of course, that is the beginning of the Civil War. And I made the case to you earlier that the Civil War spells the death of Romanticism. And it does that, really, for two reasons. One is just the death and destruction that the, on a massive scale that the Civil War puts in front of the eyes of Americans. Um, but there's a second reason, too, the way the Civil War spurs on technological and cultural changes that, uh, well, I should say technological changes that result in a deep societal change. So those are the two strains that I'm going to be looking at here with the end of Romanticism. Perhaps you remember this image. Maybe I showed it to you before. Uh, this is a lithograph, I believe, of the Battle of Bull Run, called the Battle of Manassas by the Confederates. Later, it was renamed the First Battle of Bull Run, or Manassas, because there will be a second. But at the time, they didn't know that. It was not the first, but the only. 
The date on this battle is July 21st, 1861. It's only a couple of months into the war, and this is the battle where uh, citizens from Washington, D.C. come out to the, the uh, countryside and uh, set up with their picnic baskets and blankets and opera glasses on the hills above the battlefield to watch the conflict. To them, this is going to be, they think, a quick war. They think it's going to be a kind of romantic clash of uh, two chivalrous sides. Uh, we see evidence of the, of the quick war idea in the fact that um, volunteers for the Union Army had signed up for only 90 days. They thought this would be uh, a quick clash and then uh, honor was satisfied, much like a duel where perhaps each side fires a shot, maybe into the air, uh, uh, just to show that they were brave enough to stand up to the other, and then they go home, their honor having been satisfied by that encounter. Of course, that is not how the Civil War turns out. And the battle that's about to unfold, which will see a Confederate victory and the Union troops retreating back towards Washington, D.C., and overrunning the spectators and onlookers, the Confederate Army in hot pursuit. The Confederate Army will capture important prisoners of war, including the son of a congressman who will remain in a Confederate prison for the next four years. And what they're about to see unfold is the bloodiest battle in American history to date. The total casualties of killed and wounded on both sides are about 3,500 people. And that's the bloodiest single battle that the American uh, the United States of America has seen to date, uh, not to, to our present date, but to July of 1861, right? And in fact, that battle is very quickly dwarfed. The bloodiest battle of the Civil War, will, which is Gettysburg, will see 51,000 casualties from dead, wounded, and missing. And these are not casualties that are happening as we are perhaps accustomed to with modern warfare in some faraway place. These are images that are right in Americans' own backyards. This is Richmond here in this image, Richmond, Virginia. Right? And imagine these are the kind of daily images you're seeing right in your own backyard. For us here in Lynchburg, Virginia, that would be literally in our own backyard. Uh, we have one of the late battles of the Civil War fought right here. In fact, where I'm sitting in my house right now is um, within spitting distance of uh, Fort Early. The Civil War will go on to be the bloodiest conflict by far in American history. Uh, in fact, this is the war deaths um, in the thousands, so more than 600,000 Americans from the North and the South will lose their lives in the Civil War, and it's roughly equal to, if you take all of the war deaths in every other war that we fought and add them together, that's roughly equal to the number of war deaths in the Civil War. So this spells the end of Romanticism. I think it's hard to maintain a romantic temperament about violence, about conflict, about your nation, when this is what you're seeing on a daily basis. But there's another way that the Civil War brings in change as well. There are huge cultural changes that it affects. We spoke earlier about the westward expansion of the United States, the sense of optimism and hope and promise that it seemed to offer to white American citizens as they looked towards uh, land that seemed to them to be up for the taking. Um, I want to read you a quote here. The war effort had stimulated innovations in methods of efficiently moving large numbers of people, raw materials, and goods. The first transcontinental railroad, completed in 1869, made it possible to cross the country cheaply in just a few days, whereas covered wagon processions on the overland trail, expensive to outfit and difficult to organize, required two or three months. The railroad took settlers west from the eastern seaports and also allowed for rapid, inexpensive shipment of goods, thereby 
transporting the American economy itself into the industrial age once and for all. This comes from the Norton Anthology of American Literature. Transporting the American economy into the industrial age. Well, what does that mean? And what does that entail? I'm going to kind of lay out for you four cultural currents that give rise to realism in American literature, and they stem from this new industrial age in the late 19th century. So if you're going to concentrate industry into these, um, into factories, you're going to need people to work in those factories. And so you have this need for cheap labor, people who, lots of people, who will work in centralized locations and do so for not a whole lot of money. So in order that the uh, factory owner can maximize his profits. So in order to get that cheap labor, the United States sees a, a, a huge increase in the late 19th century in immigration and urbanization. Okay, so the three currents that I'm going to start with are industrialization, immigration, and urbanization that we see in the late 19th century. I'll define each of those. Let's begin with industrialization. Industrialization is the widespread development of industries in a region. Now, industry just means manufacturing, the making of things, but what we're talking about here is especially um, such a growth in uh, industry and manufacturing that uh, it requires the growth of factories in order to more efficiently mass produce um, clothing or um, or textiles or steel or whatever it is that you're producing, right? To give an example of this, in 1850, there were 9,000 railroad, railroad miles in the United States. By 40 years later, 1890, there were 130,000 railroad miles in the United States. That's a 14-fold increase over a 40-year period. And think about what that means, that explosion of uh, railway technology across the United States. That opens up the possibility to ship raw materials to factories that convert them into goods and products, and then ship the products out to markets all across the United States cheaply, safely, and quickly. So you're concentrating labor and production in some places, in cities, and you're sending products out all over the United States. And this might seem like just a page out of a history book in some sense, but um, I want to argue to you that it um, drastically changed American life, right? So um, it's 1867 that the refrigerated car is, railway, railway car, is uh, first patented. And think about what that does. That allows meat and vegetables, which are uh, produced, that is raised and slaughtered in one area. Um, well, let's just take meat, for example. Okay, now you can put cattle on train cars. You can ship them to, let's say, Chicago to be processed there in meat packing plants. And then you can turn around and ship that meat back out all over the country. Previously, how did you get meat? Before, there was that capacity for rapid transit of goods like that. Well, you had to eat what was locally grown, right? And if you happened to live in an area where there wasn't ready access to meat, you just went without. Or if you lived in an area where there wasn't ready access to, let's say, sugar, right? That, would, that could be very expensive because the cost of shipping it long distances would, might make it prohibitively expensive for some people but now it can be very quickly, cheaply, and easily shipped around the country. This changes everyday life for Americans in huge ways, right? You don't have to just wear what you can make in, uh, in your own uh, farmstead or in your own town, right? You can now buy garments that are made in New York, right? No matter where you live. Um, you can now buy food that is produced somewhere far away, right? This industrialization that we're seeing in the late 19th century 
vastly changes American society. All right, so to efficiently work one of these factories, as I said before, you need lots of workers all in one place. And to maximize profits, owners want to pay these workers as little as possible. So where do they get lots of cheap labor? Well, there are two sources. One, this is an age of, of massive immigration into the United States. Immigration, of course, is travel into a country for the purpose of permanent residence there. And uh, just to give you a sense of the scale of things here, in 1850, there were about 2.2 million immigrants in the United States. And by 1910, there were 13.5 million immigrants in the United States. Over that 60 year period, a huge growth in the number of immigrants coming to the US. To the point where in 1910, uh, immigrants represented about 15% of the United States population. That is roughly one in six person people was an immigrant to the United States. And this has a huge uh, impact on American culture and the American imagination and the way we think about ourselves as Americans. I mean, this is the age of the Statue of Liberty, right? Right in this time period, 1850 to 1910, this is the time when the Statue of Liberty is dedicated uh, in 1886, gifted to us by France um, and, uh, and, and dedicated and, and erected in 1886. Ellis Island, just uh, a little north of Liberty Island where the Statue of Liberty sits. This, by the way, is a photograph that I took on our last New York trip, which I am, I am sadly missing that we won't be able to go this year. Guys, what a shame. Uh, but uh, so you're seeing here Liberty Island with the Statue of Liberty on it and a ways north of here would be Ellis Island, which was made an immigration, immigration station in 1890. And 70% uh, of immigrants that came to the United States came by steamship in a journey of about two weeks across the Atlantic Ocean uh, through New York. Many stayed there in New York, but many, of course, went to other places in the country also. And so that kind of cosmopolitan nature of New York City and this particular story of uh, America being a melting pot really takes root in this era of vastly increased immigration in the late 19th century, I should say the second half of the 19th century. This also is um, the time when this uh, great American poem, The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus is written. It's written in 1883 in order to help raise money to uh, put up the base of the statue there. Uh, and then, of course, once the statue's up, it's placed on a uh, bronze plaque inside the pedestal. And hopefully you will get a chance, if you haven't already, to visit New York and to see it for yourself. Now, it's just the last lines in bold that are quoted on that plaque. But the entire poem gives a new vision of what America represents to the American people. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Talking about the great Colossus of Rhodes, right? That was uh, uh, put up over a port and ships would sail underneath it. But not like that brazen, meaning both brass and kind of brash, bold, big, and with his conquering limbs. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Talking about New York and then either Brooklyn, which was considered a different city and at the time, or perhaps Jersey City, I don't know. Keep ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So notice the way Emma Lazarus is offering the Statue of Liberty as a different kind of colossus, in a sense. Not this great conquering image, but a woman with a torch 
who is the mother of exiles, who reaches her arms out to the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to be free. This becomes part of the American DNA in the second half of the 19th century with the increased immigration um, to meet the, the labor demands of industrialization. And of course, the other way that you get lots of people to work in cities is well, they move there. They leave their family farms and uh, move to where the factory jobs are. And that's called urbanization. Urbanization is the process by which large numbers of people become permanently concentrated in relatively small areas forming cities. And so what you have here is a bird's eye panorama of Manhattan and New York City in 1873. This, I believe, is the Queensboro Bridge right here, mentioned in Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby. The city scene from the Queensboro Bridge is the city scene for the first time every time you go across it, he says. Battery Park here down at the, the southern tip of Manhattan. And uh, so Central Park you can see way up here, uh, up the island some. And uh, again, I'm so sorry that we're missing it, but our hotel would have been like somewhere right in here, just south of Central Park. So this is a period that sees rapid urbanization, lots of people moving into cities, and New York is a great example, New York City. It grew sevenfold in 50 years' time. In 1850, there were half a million people living in New York, which is certainly big by 19th century standards, um, but not huge. Uh, London is bigger, for example. But by 1900, there are 3.5 million in New York. That is a sevenfold increase over 50 years. And so just to give you a sense of scale, uh, 50 years ago, New York City from today, New York City had 8 million people. And today it has 8.5 million people, right? Um, so that's about a 6% increase over our last 50 years. But if you go back to 1900, that was a 700% increase over their last 50 years. Huge, rapid urbanization there in New York. Chicago is another great example. Uh, here's a photograph of Chicago in 1900, right? Um, you see the trolley cars there on the side and the horse-drawn uh, carriages uh, right there down the side of the street. Uh, if you look online, there, there are also some great, amazing photographs of Lynchburg around this time also. We used to have a trolley car system uh, that went uh, right down Main Street downtown. Chicago is founded in 1833, and by 1850, it has a population of 30,000 living there. And 50 years later for Chicago, it has a population of 1.7 million. It sprouts almost overnight. So that's the same time period where New York saw seven-fold growth. Chicago sees 50-fold growth over that period of 50 years. That would be like if you had grandkids come to New Covenant 50 years from today, and it was as big as Virginia Tech. That's the kind of growth that we're talking about in the same span of time. What draws people to Chicago? Well, factory jobs, working um, in steel mills, working in meatpacking plants. Um, the railroad is big there too. All right, so to review our currents in 19th century American culture so far that are going to lead to, to realism, we, we talked about industrialization, immigration, and urbanization. And now I want to talk about the technological progress that comes out of all of these things. And it is here, perhaps, that the break with Romanticism might just be the starkest. So let's review Romanticism just a little bit here. Remember, Romanticism looked to the magical past, to nature in its untamed wildness and sublimity that makes man look small, yes, but still um, significant because of his spiritual capacities for experience and emotion and change. And how can that enthusiasm remain when the present seems filled with greater wonders than the past? This is an image 
I told you earlier that in 1869 the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, a railroad that connected the East Coast to the West Coast and cut the time to traverse the United States from several months to um, just weeks. Think about the symbolism involved in a picture like this. Compare the one on the left to the one on the right. What has the, the horse meant in um, chivalric literature? It's not just a means of transportation, right? It's the knight's um, noble steed, right? It represents his, um, well, chivalry. It just comes from the word meaning horseman. Right? And yet we attach all of these ideas of conduct and honor and duty and defense of the defenseless to it, right? And so the horse underneath it, the knight, comes to represent all of that in symbolically in the popular imagination. So when somebody takes a photograph like this on the right, we know who's going to win that race, right? That is a symbolic victory of machine over this older... Um, nobler mode of transportation and, um, and symbol. And this is the era too when that, this kind of conflict that you're seeing playing out on the right um, shows up a lot in the, the folk legends that are told and retold. This is the era of uh, when the story of John Henry becomes popular. I just found out, by the way, in prepping this, uh, this PowerPoint, that uh, Terry Crews is starring in a, or maybe has already starred in a John Henry movie that's coming out in 2020. Um, but do you know the story of John Henry? John Henry is the, um, uh, the black American who uh, dies with his hammer in his hands. Right, he's a um, he works for the railroad, and he, he carves out tunnels, or he drives the spikes to place the dynamite charges to blast out tunnels and that kind of thing. And he has this competition with a steam-powered rock drilling machine that he just barely wins because he's John Henry, he's so strong. But the effort of barely winning it kills him, right? And that death too is symbolic of the death of an old way, a kind of man-centric way of doing things, and the advent of this new technological age. This was an era when technology pushed the limits of human experience into realms that were previously considered sorcery. Look at this painting here called The Bard. And there's the castle in the background and the huge sublime mountains. But you have the bard uh, there in the center of the image uh, with his harp in one hand or his lyre. And he's, his, his arm is outraised. He's, his voice is echoing through the ravine there, right? And there's something um, almost supernatural about the bard's ability to tell stories of the gods, right? But this is an era where that supernatural ability is uh, becoming accessible in different ways. Think about what these technologies can do for a second. Like the bard, man can now project his voice over vast distances of space and time, right? Here is the, uh, the telegraph, the first... Um, the uh, Atlantic Telegraph Cable um, was completed in 1854. So now somebody could be sitting in a, a city in the East Coast, let's say New York, of the United States, and send a message all the way across to London and do it in mere minutes. It wasn't instantaneous, but it was close to it in mere minutes, contrasted with the 10 days or two weeks that a message over ship would have taken. This is an ability that we, of course, completely take for granted because we have all kinds of telecommunication um, uh, technology at our fingertips, but it's really pretty remarkable that you can send your voice anywhere in the world. Somebody who is not physically present with you can hear it, even if they are thousands of miles away, right? Same for the telephone. This is um, 1876 Alexander Graham Bell's early telephone. And what about this one? This is the phonograph. Uh, invented in 1877 by Thomas Edison. You can record your voice. You can, you can literally hear the voices of the dead on a machine like that. 
that used to require some kind of blood sacrifice, right? To call up the ghost of your father from uh, the underworld and ask him. But uh, now this is something that's um, made possible by these crazy new technologies. And remember that the Romantics appreciated the sublime in nature. I think maybe I, oh, okay. Uh, that fearful vastness that sends a shiver down your spine and reminds you that you are small in the face of a much larger and more powerful nature. But now our grand spaces are man-made. What we're seeing here is the, um, and um, they're made possible by technologies which just simply didn't exist a generation ago. This is the Crystal Palace from London's 1851 Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations. And uh, it's, a, it's a construction of steel and glass using steel technology and glass technology that just hadn't existed uh, earlier in the 19th century. And so you've got this massive... Uh, building where you have you house all of the great uh, scientific discoveries and technologies of the age and people from all over the world come and look at all these exhibitions of what man is doing and achieving and accomplishing right um, I, I've lost my interior picture of it um, let me see maybe I can get it back real quickly here slide that guy out of the way and see if I can pop it back up Oh, no, that just confused things. No, there it is. Okay, there's a, a painting of the interior of it, right? It's um, our sublime spaces, our kind of larger-than-life spaces that make you feel small in their presence are now man-made. And I think the symbolism of this tree here in the middle is not to be missed, right? We enclose nature in these vast man-made structures now in the late 19th century. This World's Fair begins, the first one of the Crystal Palace that I just showed you is in London, but uh, in the next uh, decades of the 19th century, they come to a number of American cities, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, um, St. Louis, San Francisco. And think about this one here for a minute. If you're looking for a technology that is um, speaks to man's expanding power over nature. I think this might be your go-to right here. Think about what a uh, an enormous groundbreaker of an invention this must have been. I might go so far as to say perhaps the most significant invention of the modern era. There were experiments with creating light from electricity throughout the 1800s, but Edison first produced a usable 40-hour bulb in 1879. And think about the way that electric light changes human experience beyond the bounds of what previously would have been possible, right? Electric light powers the high-energy, fast-paced, up-all-night lifestyle that we moderns assume is distinctive about city life, the life that more and more Americans are moving into throughout the late 19th century. And maybe it represents ultimate control over our own time. We are no longer ruled by the greater light by day and the lesser light by night. We don't have to just go to bed when the sun goes down or shortly thereafter because burning oil or candles all night long is not very bright and is rather expensive. So what do you do? You just go to bed and you get up when the sun comes up the next day. But electric light makes us feel like, anyway, masters of our own time in this, uh, in this entirely new way. Maybe we even see ourselves as having this godlike capacity to say, let there be light when we want there to be light um, and stay up all night if we want to. When we get to the Great Gatsby, notice how Fitzgerald uses electric light as a symbol of that modern lifestyle. We'll talk about that later when we get there. Okay, so let me sum up what we've done so far. This is a quote that comes from a book called The Growth of American Literature. The triumphs of the sciences in invention and engineering began to effect the first major change 
in human life since men had left the forests and prairies to settle down in farming villages. The shift from an agricultural to an industrial society. Fast, long-range transportation and communication, specialized cash crop farming, and large-scale industries changed every fashion of human life, including man's most basic relations to nature. The culture of the family farm and the self-contained village was destroyed. People began to concentrate in the industrial megalopolis, in factory-centered masses. Here they faced situations for which their cultural heritage had not prepared them. Slowly and blindly, they had to begin adapting that heritage to radically new conditions. So we're talking about the shift from an agricultural to an industrial society. So what does this do to literature? What does this do to art? It has to meet the demands of a society that is now organized on in entirely different ways. Now, certainly there are some things that remain human universals, and those old human universal themes continue to come up in literature, and we'll see that when we look at Huck Finn and The Great Gatsby and many of the poems that we're looking at. But things are very different, and literature and art reacts to that difference by leaving behind the old romantic sensibilities and moving to this new sensibility called realism. Well, what is realism? This quote is from the Norton Anthology of American Literature. The term realism labels a movement in English, European, and American literature that gathered force in America from the 1860s to the end of the century. Realists attempted to record life as it was lived rather than life as it ought to be lived. The term used for this at the time was idealism, or had been lived in times past. The term used for that at the time was romance. So not the way life ought to be lived or the way life used to be lived in this past, most especially this like magically imagine this uh, imagined past in a magical sense, right? But we want now to record life as it is actually lived. As defined by William Dean Howells, the magazine editor who was for some decades the chief American advocate of realist aesthetics, as well as the author of over 30 novels, realism is, quote, nothing more and nothing less than the truthful treatment of material. Realism seeks to convince readers that the life in the book's pages is true to ordinary people in familiar surroundings. So in response to this enormous cultural change in America, literature and art changed also by saying what we need to do is focus on the present, not on a past, uh, a magical past, or a past ideally imagined, right? We need to focus on the way actual people of all social classes, and maybe especially the poorer classes in cities, actually live and tell their stories their stories are worth hearing also. And as I tell that story, I want to capture um, life as it's actually lived and dialogue as it's actually spoken, right? So here are some of the tenets that you see in realistic literature. The plot is supposed to be plausible, everyday, true to life. So contrast this with the stories of Poe or with the Scarlet Letter and Nathaniel Hawthorne, right? The plot needs to be plausible every day and true to life. The setting of these stories is often urban in cities. The author will use details to capture local color and increase verisimilitude, which is a word meaning that sense of being true to life, right? So in a realistic work, the author, whether it's a story or a movie, movies do this too, right? Uh, the camera might kind of hover on a particular ordinary detail that you as a viewer know, okay, I'm not supposed to make a whole lot of this. This just, um, you know, I, I see uh, dust on the windowsill, let's say, right? So um, that just seems like it's the kind of place that actual people actually live in, right? So the details are included not always because they are 
meaningful in the larger sense, but uh, just because they um, make the story seem true to life. Right? The characters are to be complex and psychologically real. And this is, this is one of those enduring influences of realism. We expect that our characters, even in non-realistic settings and in our fantasy movies, we expect that our characters would have um, genuine or psychologically real motivations for the decisions that they make, right? We are happily willing to watch superheroes fly around and, uh, and knock down buildings and, and fight giant aliens and that kind of thing. But if one of them should make a dumb decision that seems unmotivated by anything in the character's psychology, we just say, oh, this movie's so unrealistic, <laughs> right? And then, of course, somebody else says, well, it's not supposed to be realistic. It's a superhero movie, right? But that's not what the complaint meant, right? We still expect psychological realism, even in our fantasy um, fiction. In uh, realism, social class is important, and the story often pays attention to the effects of social class. And the characters who populate the story and the protagonists of the story often belong to the lower classes. Realist authors like to use what's called vernacular diction. Diction, remember, is the word choice of, uh, of a work or in a particular instance. So they have word choice that is, um, or they choose words that ordinary people in that region would have spoken. They don't use elevated or poetic diction. So maybe a great way to think about this would be contrast Pearl in uh, the Scarlet Letter. And uh, Pearl didn't really speak like a child, like a three-year-old or a four-year-old, right? Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne didn't make any attempt to capture the way a child sounds in the way he wrote her dialogue. Does that make sense? But when you read realistic literature, um, the spelling is changed, the um, punctuation is changed, and uh, the sentences are changed to try to capture the way that people actually sound when they speak. Right? And the narrator um, in realism usually remains objective. They prefer an objective, third-person objective point of view and refrains from making moral comment on the novel's events. So Romanticism lost its charm for writers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They wanted realism, accurate observation, and portrayal of the ordinary lives of ordinary people. It's no accident that this is the golden age of the newspaper and that many of the era's best writers, Ambrose Bierce, Stephen Crane, Theodore Dreiser, Jack London, Mark Twain, Walt Whitman, they all got their start as newspaper journalists. And that's not a bad understanding of realism. The author as newspaper reporter. Realism prized the author's powers of observation, accuracy of detail, faithful recreation of language as it was spoken, and attention to previously unnoticed classes of people. We'll see all of these facets next week when we look at Mark Twain. <laughs>